Back in 2016, almost eight years ago, the chess engine known as Alpha Zero burst onto the chess scene by beating Stockfish, the highest version of Stockfish at the time, in the TCEC World Championship. The TCEC is like a world computer chess championship where they play hundreds of games against each other and an aggregate score is taken. My old maths teacher actually used to have TCEC um, on a different tab when he was teaching maths lessons and I'd occasionally go glance at it. Mad to think that was so long ago now. But Alpha Zero came up with the very novel idea because of the way it was designed to play millions of chess games against itself and learn from what worked against itself, if you see what I mean. So it came up with the very novel idea of pushing the flank pawns, the A and H pawns, into the opponent's territory with no real reason other than to take away space from the opponent and kind of cramp the opponent's position, also posing a potential threat in the end game, as the pawn would already be on the opponent's third rank. That's exactly what I did in, in today's game analysis. It's not necessarily the most tactical game, the most hype game, but I think it poses a lot of interesting strategic ideas and hopefully you guys can find it useful in your own chess games. So without further ado, let's get into the game. All right, you guys already know we have a Caro. Beautiful. What just what a move C6 is. It could it should have a brilliant move. It it genuinely should. This book thing is just a glitch. It's supposed to be brilliant. D4, D5. And my opponent takes. The exchange is actually quite common. E5, you would expect. It gets played a lot. But a lot of people exchange now. We have bishop d3, knight f6, c3, and queen c7. Queen c7 is given an accuracy. The point is, this bishop often likes to come to f4. So putting my queen on c7 makes that a bit more difficult. And the queen often likes to come out to b3. So my queen can defend the b7 square, allowing this bishop to develop. So that's the idea of queen c7. Knight f3 isn't a great move because it allows bishop g4. And this is a difficult pin to break. Normally the knight goes to e2 so that this pin isn't that great because the queen can just move and bishop takes knight can be met with bishop takes bishop. But my opponent goes queen b3. Here, I can already take and double my opponent's pawns, and this is a horrible pawn structure. But I decide on knight c6 first, just because this knight can't really do anything anyway. Now we could play knight bd2, and then if I take now, he just takes back with the knight. But here I get normal development, and, you know... It's still a good position for me. I get everything I want. This bishop is blocked in, which is a downside. Normally the bishop likes to come out before the knight is moved. And if my opponent tries to kick me, then this is a trade that I am more than happy to make. Because, I mean, that looks terrible for white. I'm probably just going to develop my bishop and slide my king across rather than castle to keep my rook on the h-file. So my opponent plays bishop g5, and now, because the bishop has come out, and knight bd2 is now a good move, because it doesn't block in the bishop, I take. g takes, and I go e6, and I go, look, if you want to take me, take me. I don't care if my pawns get doubled, because I'm not going to castle my king anyway. I'm going to bring my rook to the g-file, put my bishop on d6, move my king to e7, and my king's going to be very safe there. And your king is not going to be safe. I can also play moves like queen f4 potentially. To start harassing the white position. So knight d2 is played. I go a5. This is the reason for the title of the video. And while the computer claims it's a mistake. I think this is quite a good move. Because either my opponent goes a4. And then I can continue playing as normal, but 
I have induced this move from white. Just weakens his grip on the b3 square. And this b pawn could become weak in the future if the queen moves and I get my queen onto the b file. But you know, a5, a4. Whilst I don't gain an advantage, I also don't lose anything by playing a5, right? This square is nicely protected. I don't really want to go a6 anyway, because I don't care if anything comes to the b5 square, as my knight is nicely defended. But my opponent goes knight f1. Point is, the knight has no real future on d2, so he wants to bring it in via e3 or g3. Then this allows my plan to continue, inspired by alpha zero, of a4, hitting the queen, queen retreats, and a3. Now if my opponent takes on a3, then rook takes a3, pressures this pawn, my rook is glued into place by my bishop, also threatens the c3 pawn if my queen can open up, uh, say my opponent plays something like knight g3, can actually take as well, because after queen takes, bishop b4 pins the queen to the king. So, you can't really take the pawn. You also can't really ignore it, because if you ignore it, I'm going to take you, and after queen takes, I have pressure on the a2 pawn, the a3 square is available for my bishop, and the c3 pawn is weak because the b pawn has been forced to move. And obviously if you completely ignore me, yeah, I, I just take. So my opponent goes b3, which does two things. Firstly, it means my pawn is going to stay on a3 forever, since it is very nicely protected. Takes up the b2 square, but it's going to be a problem in many endgames for white because this pawn is stuck and could become weak. And if it's taken, I'm only two squares away from promotion. Like I said before, I don't give anything up by doing this maneuver. And this uh, and the a4 move also came with an attack and a3 forced white to respond. So I only really lost one move with a5. Also, the move b3 weakens the c3 square, which after bishop e7, knight g3, rook c8, I try to apply some pressure to. Rook c8 is a very venomous move. It carries a threat behind it if my opponent doesn't respond accurately. And my opponent castles, which is a blunder. And I would encourage you to try and find the move for the black pieces here. That rook c8 sets up. The move is knight takes d4. And the point is the queen is under attack. And I win a pawn. I'm also threatening f3. So say you play a move like queen d1. Defending f3 and stepping out of the attack. I just retreat the knight. I come away with a clean pawn. And c3 is still very weak can also bring my knight into e5 or something at some point potentially but I just win a pawn so my opponent takes and after queen takes queen bishop takes queen rook takes bishop I'm just a clean pawn up because I won the d4 pawn but my opponent goes rook se1 and here I have to be very accurate because if I say take take and castle then rook c7 is going to win a pawn back. There's a bishop d6, rook takes b7. The b pawn is now passed. My pieces are quite passive. And one of the things I do have going for me is this knight struggles to get into the game. But also, the a3 pawn is really useful. Because even though white has a passed b pawn, it's miles away. Whereas if this pawn falls, I'm only two squares away from promotion. But here I'm giving too much to white. I'm allowing too much. So instead of castling after takes takes. Well, there is actually something else you could do. You could play rook c6. So if takes takes rook c1, king d7. 
and you don't allow the rook in. But I don't really like closing off the C file because the B file I, I, I can't really do anything with. So instead I opt to trade and play King D7. Stopping the rook's entry, all of the entry squares in my position on the C file are taken up by something or other. So white can't infiltrate. And after knight e2, looking to reroute the knight, I play rook c8. With the idea of here, here, knight c3. And I can play a move like knight g8, offering a trade. And if my opponent goes for knight b5, attacking the a6 pawn, I have knight f5. And if my opponent takes, then I take the d-pawn. This is very scary for my opponent. And my king is also far closer to these pawns than his king is. So here, my opponent would probably just have to maintain the defense, try and bring his king into the game. But eventually, he will be forced to take, and I will win the d4 pawn. Well, probably go here to defend f3. And I've got a very strong pawn center, past d pawn, and very active king. So, instead, my opponent opts to play knight c3, blocking the trade. But this allows bishop b4. And my opponent goes to knight a4, which the computer gives an inaccuracy. I would call it a blunder. Because after rook takes c1, bishop takes c1. There is a really important move here for the black pieces. King c6. And the knight, because of the power of this a3 pawn, has no way to escape without being taken. Now, the best course of action is probably to go to c5 and give up a pawn to save the knight and force an exchange. But my opponent tries bishop e3. Just trying to say I play b5 here. Then knight c5, and takes takes. Technically, he retains the pawn, because if I go knight d7, he has b4, anchoring in his pawn. But I can also just play b4, stopping his idea, and just going knight d7 and winning it this way. But instead, I play the move knight d7 immediately. So after the king moves, b4, knight can only go to c5, and I trade everything, and I'm two pawns up and completely winning. And that is the power of what I would call like an alpha zero pawn push, because this knight just couldn't retreat, and whilst the effectiveness of the pawn in terms of being a threat to promote wasn't shown in this game, did also weaken the queenside squares quite significantly to make these sorts of tactics work in the position. I hope you guys enjoyed today's video. In case you didn't know, I release a new chess video every single day. So if that's something you'd be interested in, then, you know, drop us a cheeky little subscribe. I'd very much appreciate it. And I hope you will appreciate the consistent uploads and consistent chess every single day. With that, go enjoy the rest of your day or evening or night. Let's be honest, you're probably watching this at 2am, so go get some sleep.